like most cities in the world, London was sent into lockdown. The streets emptied, the tourists disappeared, and London fell strangely quiet. The corridors of power at Westminster were emptied out, as the members of Parliament also worked remotely, and work stopped on the restoration of Big Ben, or rather, St Elizabeth's Tower. The Square Mile has been a major trading and financial hub since the Middle Ages and is home to the Bank of England, but the streets of the City of London also fell silent. Famous historical tourist attractions like the Tower of London suddenly stood empty and shopping, the arts and music venues in Camden and across the capital had to close their doors with no idea of when they could reopen. Like many capital cities around the world, London came to an abrupt stop and places like Leicester Square that are normally filled with people 24 hours a day were suddenly deserted. Just up from Waterloo Station, you come past the South Bank's Art Centre, which was built in the 1950s as part of the Festival of Britain. It now lies at the heart of this normally vibrant area, with many bars and restaurants surrounding it. As you come up to the river, you end up on the tree-lined pathways of the South Bank. This part of the River Thames, with its multiple arts, music and theatre offerings, is usually filled with people. But during the London lockdown, the benches were taped up and the pavements empty. Heading west along the South Bank takes you past the National Theatre. This theatre had its first performance in 1963 with Laurence Olivier, but it didn't come here until the building was completed in 1976. The ornate street lamps that run along the edge of the river were originally designed during the Victorian era, but more were added in 1977 to commemorate the Queen's Silver Jubilee. The South Bank of London developed much later than the North and was originally much more rural and green than the heart of London, which lay north of the river. The south side of the River Thames got hard hit during the Second World War, which allowed for the restoration and design that we have today, with fantastic views across the River Thames towards St Paul's Cathedral and the old financial heart in the City of London. Westminster Bridge is perhaps one of London's most famous bridges, leading across to the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben. If you look east while on the bridge, you will see the London Eye that was erected to mark the new millennium, which has 32 observation capsules and will take you up to 130 metres above the river. On the north side of the river near Charing Cross is Nelson's Column, which is situated in Trafalgar Square. The column was put up to celebrate the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1843, and it stands 169 feet tall, or 52 meters high. If you move to the north side of Trafalgar Square, 
you will find the National Gallery. This building has always been designed to provide access to the arts for all. Its central London location was chosen in 1824 so that it could be reached by the wealthy in the West London, as well as the poor people who typically lived in the East End. If you walk 10 minutes north of Trafalgar Square, you come to Piccadilly Circus, home to the famous Eros statue. This statue, although it is often referred to as the statue of Eros, is actually thought to represent his brother, Antiros, and was one of the first statues in the world to be made from aluminium when it was first erected in 1893. Leaving Piccadilly Circus behind and moving west, we travel down the usually busy shops of Coventry Street, which were boarded up during the London lockdown. We arrive at Leicester Square, which is usually filled with musicians and people queuing to go to the various cinemas or in the casinos. The square was pedestrianised during the 1980s and then given a £15 million makeover in 2012, just in time for the London Olympics. Ten minutes walk north of Leicester Square is London's most famous shopping street. Oxford Street, home to some of London's most iconic stores such as Selfridges which takes up a whole block and opened in 1909 but it took another 10 years for the whole store to be finished and open up. These days it is home to world famous brands like Moschino, Tiffany, Paul Smith, Adidas, Ralph Lauren, Calvin Klein and Armani to name but a few. At the far end of Oxford Street is Hyde Park, one of London's eight royal parks with water features and statues. On the south side of Hyde Park is Kensington Gardens. This is actually a separate royal park, which was once part of Hyde Park, but in 1689, King William and his wife Mary decided to have it as a garden and developed it during their time on the throne. Queen Victoria built a statue to her husband, Prince Albert, who died of typhoid fever at the age of 42. And the stunning 187 carved figures in this memorial depict his passion for the arts, commerce, agriculture and engineering. On the south side of Hyde Park is the circular building of the Royal Albert Hall. This distinctive building is home to the Proms, which is an annual festival of classical music which first took place in 1895. Further west in Knightsbridge, the store Harrods began life in 1824. That building was burnt down in 1883 and the building we see today was opened in 1884. Continuing further west in Kensington is the Victoria and Albert Museum of Design, Art and Fashion. Like many London museums, it is free to enter and it houses over 2.3 million objects that span over 5,000 years of human creativity. A little further down Cromwell Road is the usually packed National History Museum. 
which is home to the Dinosaur's Gallery, which currently stands strangely empty. Constitution Hill is a road that runs through Green Park to Buckingham Palace. The palace has been rebuilt many times, but it was early in the 18th century when the Duke of Buckingham moved there that it got its name as Buckingham House. King George III bought it in 1762 as a private family residence for his wife, Queen Charlotte, and it was known as the Queen's House. But St James Palace remained the official location for royal affairs. When King George III's son, King George IV, took over the throne in 1820, he decided that it should become a palace and the official seat of the court. From then on, it became a royal residence that we know today as Buckingham Palace, the Queen's main residence. Covent Garden has a rich and long history. Originally, the gardens belonged to Westminster Abbey before the dissolution of the monasteries in 1536. It is situated in a charming central location, some five minutes walk from Charing Cross Station, Soho or Leicester Square, and is now filled with shops and normally a busy mix of shoppers and tourists alike. Covent Garden has its own underground station, which is on the Piccadilly line. And it is a short walk from there, down the cobbled, pedestrianised streets to the market itself. The fruit and vegetable market began in 1654 and was there for over 300 years until it came to an end in 1974 as the area became too congested and was instead redeveloped as a tourist and shopping destination. Moving north, we arrive at Camden, a vibrant community which over the last 50 years has become a beacon for edgy street fashion, music and art. It is also home to the world famous Camden Market. Big as it is today, the market only really began life in 1974 with just 16 stalls and it only took place on a Sunday. Normally it is busy day and night, so it is rare to see Camden so quiet and still and with so few people about. Although it is known to locals and tourists alike as Camden Lock, Camden Lock doesn't actually exist. The correct name for the lock near the market is the Hampstead Road Lock. It is a great place to relax by the water and pick up a coffee or some food from the multitude of street food stalls around the market. Dingwalls is a live music and entertainment venue which has hosted the likes of the Sex Pistols, Amy Winehouse and Coldplay over the years. The market itself is huge and sprawling and is a fun place to explore and visit all the market stalls. Further east along Regent's Canal, you come to King's Cross, home to the famous St Pancras Station and King's Cross Station, featured in many of the Harry Potter movies. 
This was quite a rundown area in the late 80s and 90s, but the whole area has been hugely developed over recent years. This station was built during the Victorian era in 1868. St Pancras Station is London's portal to Europe, with Eurostar trains shuttling passengers from the UK capital to the European continent in two hours. This whole area was an industrial wasteland and home to a few clubs like Bagley's during the 90s and early 2000s. But it has been subject to one of London's largest redevelopments, which got underway in 2008. And it will soon be home to the new Google headquarters. Just over the canal from Google is Coal Drops Yard. Victorian London was a city powered by coal and Coal Drops Yard was its coal store, bringing coal down from the north on the adjacent canal. From here, it was taken on horse-drawn carts and delivered around the city. Now this yard has been transformed into a 100,000 square foot retail district with over 50 shops, restaurants and bars populating its cobbled alleyways. But it is also home to the Samsung KX experience, though like all the shops in the area, this was shut down during the London lockdown. Coming back to the Thames and travelling further east, we pass through the normally buzzing pavements in front of the Five Star Sea Containers Hotel towards Blackfriars Bridge, with St Paul's Cathedral visible on the other side of the river, next to the new skyscrapers of the City of London and its iconic buildings such as the Gherkin, the Cheese Grater, Lloyd's of London and the Walkie Talkie Building which has a public viewing gallery near the top. There has been a church at the site of St Paul's Cathedral since 600 AD. The church that was there was destroyed in the Great Fire of London and in 1675 Sir Christopher Wren designed the version that stands there today and has become one of London's most iconic buildings. Standing opposite St Paul's on the south bank is the Tate Modern Museum. This was an iconic power station, but in May 2000, after being redeveloped, it opened its doors as the Tate Modern. At the same time, a new bridge was built, the Millennium Bridge, which opened in June 2000 and crosses the river from the Tate Modern over to St Paul's on the north side. When they first opened it, however, they had to quickly close it again as it moved around too much as people crossed it and it became known as the Wobbly Bridge. Its design was created to draw you into St Paul's, which is perfectly framed by the bridge as you cross over the river. As you move up St Peter's Hill, the buildings on either side still provide a perfect frame for St Paul's as you walk up towards the cathedral. St Paul's Cathedral has one of the largest domes in the world, which miraculously escaped damage during the Second World War, 
and Winston Churchill asked firefighters to prioritize saving St. Paul's so that it could remain as a symbol of strength and resilience to help boost the nation's morale during the war. For a while, St. Paul's held the record as London's tallest building. In fact, it held it for over 250 years from 1710 to 1965. But the BT Tower took that title when it was opened in 1965. These days, it is about the 50th tallest building in London, and it was where Prince Charles and Diana got married in 1981. Continuing east, you arrive at the large fortress of the Tower of London. When William the Conqueror won the Battle of Hastings in 1066, he came to London and built this fortress as a demonstration of power. And it is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and home to the famous Beefeater Guards. The Tower of London is where the crown jewels of the royal family are kept and it is the most complete 11th century fortress palace remaining in Europe. As you move down the side of the Tower of London, you come towards one of London's most iconic bridges, Tower Bridge. This bridge was completed in 1894, and at the time it was the largest bascule opening bridge in the world. On average, it is open three times a day, or about a thousand times per year, but you must give 24 hours notice if you need the bridge opened to let your ship or boat pass through. There are great views from the bridge to the Shard and City Hall, which is on the south side of the river and home to the Mayor of London. The Shard is in fact London's tallest building, which is 306 metres tall and faces the buildings of London Square Mile and the Tower of London on the north side of the river. The Shard is home to a hotel, numerous businesses, bars and restaurants, as well as having two viewing platforms. It opened its doors in February 2013. Tower Bridge itself has a weight limit for vehicles crossing it of 18 tonnes to stop the bridge being damaged and London buses just make it as they weigh approximately 12.5 tonnes when empty and up to 18 tonnes when they are full. Further west along the River Thames you come to the modern financial capital of London Canary Wharf. Normally buzzing with people from early morning, the financial capital emptied out quickly at the beginning of the London lockdown. Canary Wharf is surrounded by water, not just the Thames, but also the docks that crisscross the peninsula. Back in the 19th century, much of the fruit and vegetables from the Canary Island and Spain were unloaded here, which is how the area got its name. Canary Wharf Underground Station sits on the Jubilee Line, and although this station was only opened in 1999, it is one of London's busiest stations, with over 40 million passengers passing through its doors each year. The first building to be built at Canary Wharf was One Canada Square, which is the second tallest building in London after the Shard. One Canada Water opened its doors on August of 1991, and although Canary Wharf as a project has experienced some financial difficulties, 
it has relatively quickly established itself as the new financial capital of London, now being home to the likes of Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, HSBC and Citigroup, as well as becoming a destination in its own right. The London skyline is constantly evolving, and there are plans for several more skyscrapers in the coming years across London, from Blackfriars to the Square Mile, Bishopsgate to Canary Wharf. The historical and cultural aspects of London will no doubt be preserved, and perhaps these tall buildings are a way to allow expansion and provide more homes, office spaces and tourist attractions while still maintaining the cultural identity of this great city.